Uh, this evening I'd like to uh, read for you just a, a brief passage of Scripture from 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, which you might say is the prologue or the introduction to the uh, first letter of John. By the way, you'll, you'll notice as I read this some uh, familiar language uh, which really shows us that the author of this letter is the same author as that of the gospel and also the author of the book of Revelation. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, Jesus is only called the Word of God in the gospel of John, in the letters of John, and in the book of Revelation, which are the letters or, or the books that, that John wrote. And I actually chose this passage because it again brings to our attention the idea of the Word, and I had originally intended to deal with that, but I realized I was by now far too big of a, of a chunk, and I just wouldn't have time to do that. So we're going to deal with that when we get to, uh, I believe it's verse 18 of the Gospel of John, where it talks about how um, the Word basically explains to us or reveals God to us. We see what God is like in human flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, what I want you to see from this text is the, the teaching of the Trinity, and it may not necessarily be apparent at first, but when we get into it, uh, we'll see that that is what John is referring to here. But let me go ahead and read the first four verses. John writes this, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, as I already mentioned this morning, uh, John introduced us to Jesus as the eternal word, the one who was present with God from the very beginning, the one who created absolutely everything that there is, the one who is God himself, and yet, as we saw, the one who was not the only one who is called God. He is God, and yet he was with God, as we've already heard this evening. Uh, John was actually introducing us not only to the deity of Christ, but also to the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, sometimes, um, as you know, the word doctrine or doctrine itself can get a bad rap. You know, most Christians don't really want to learn about doctrine. They don't, don't teach me these kinds of things. They basically want just to love God and to love others. You know, they're more interested in relationship than they are on theology or in theology. And really, with all the time that the church has spent in the past on doctrine, and oftentimes to the exclusion of relationship, it's not surprising to see the pendulum you know, swing in the direction that it has. Uh, focusing on knowledge only can certainly, you know, produce a, as we've already heard it called this evening, a dead orthodoxy if we do not apply that knowledge to our lives, if we don't actually live it. You know, there's a, a term that's, that we call, at least in our circles sometimes, experiential or experimental Calvinism. Uh, experimental Calvinism almost sounds like uh, you know Calvinistic scientists you know that are doing some kind of uh, experimentation with certain things. Well, what they mean by that is experiencing what the Bible actually says. You know, not just reading about it, knowing that it's true or that it happened sometime in in history, but that it's actually true today. Something that we experience: this love of God in our hearts, this this birth of the Spirit of God, this transformation into the image of Christ. It is possible, as you know, to have right belief but still have a dead heart. Uh, experimental or experiential Calvinism is basically meant to teach us that we need to have a right belief and a right heart. We need to see that both of them are important. As a matter of fact, they should be integrated in our lives. Our beliefs should dictate 
the way we live. As you've probably heard me say once before, if we don't live according to what we believe, eventually what's going to happen is that our beliefs are going to change to match our lives. That's why we need to be careful. Um, it's, there's the, the tug one way or the other. Typically, our lives are not going to conform to what we believe unless we repent and really seek the Lord. There's a lot of work involved in that. But if we don't work, if we're not seeking to become like Christ, our lives aren't going to be consistent with our beliefs and our beliefs are eventually going to change to remove the conflict between the two. And that's, of course, when we get into danger. That's why we need to be on our guard against that all the time. Now, especially in the two doctrines that we are looking at today, the deity of Christ, which we saw this morning, is that important to your salvation? It is important that you believe it because if you don't believe it, Jesus says you can't be saved. He says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So you have to believe that. Of course, you also have to trust it. But what I want us to see this evening is the same thing is true regarding the Trinity. You must believe in the true God if you're going to have the right Jesus, the right Son of God, in order that you might be saved. So what I'd like to do this evening, again, is not consider everything that we might possibly consider regarding the Trinity, but I do want us to see that, that this is the teaching of Scripture, that you might believe it, that you might believe that He is triune, and I want you to see what difference it makes, why it is important that you believe it and that you live accordingly. Everything God teaches us should make a difference in the way that we live. So first of all, what is the biblical teaching on the Trinity? Well, I'll put it most simply, there is one God who is three persons. Yeah, that's about the simplest way. And actually, I told you that that's revealed in our passage this evening, though it may not necessarily look like it on the surface. I mean, we do see uh, two persons here. Uh, John wrote to testify concerning the word of life, which we saw in John 1.1, 1, 1, that Jesus is the word and Jesus is the life. He's the light, the light of life, and so forth. He is the eternal life. He is the one who was with the Father, he tells us here. The one who is the Son of God. Now, John is writing to his readers regarding him so that they might have fellowship with, with him, that is, with John and those who were with him. But he wants them to know that his fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, both the Father and the Son are mentioned, but where is the Spirit in the midst of all of this? Well, he is the fellowship, you see, that John experiences with the Father and the Son. He is what he wants his readers to experience. He wants them to have the Spirit of God and the fellowship that comes through the Spirit of God, which is why he is writing to them about Jesus Christ, so that they might receive the Spirit. As we often hear in God's benediction in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now we understand grace, we understand love, but what is this fellowship of the Spirit that he's referring to here? Well, basically it is that which ties us all together. The Spirit of God is the one who enables us to have fellowship, which isn't just getting together to talk about the weather or getting together to speak about maybe what we saw in this movie or how we enjoyed this sporting event. But it's how we might share the love of Christ. It's sharing the love of Christ, sharing the gifts He has given to us, sharing uh, the love of the Spirit of God with one another in Christ. As we also read this morning in Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, where we often look at that passage to think about Jesus being in the form of God, He starts off in this way. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. You know, I think what Paul is referring to here is this fellowship of the Spirit that we all enjoy. The encouragement in Christ, the consolation of love, the fellowship of the Spirit, the affection and the compassion, all of these 
are fruits of the Spirit of God that He enables us to express towards one another, which is that bond of love that unites us all together. The Spirit of God is the one who actually brings this about, as we saw not too long ago, by baptizing us into the body of Christ, by uniting us and linking us together in one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So really what John is referring to here includes all the members of the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one who gives us fellowship with the Father and the Son, and he also gives us fellowship with one another. So basically the Lord reveals to you in his word that there is one God, and yet there are three persons who are called God. Now let's look at a couple of passages. First of all, the fact that there's one God. Let me just remind you, Isaiah 44, 8. And there are many passages in Isaiah that are so pointed that they work, well, they, they, they should work if the Lord is working through them on anyone who believes there are more gods than one. He says in Isaiah 44, 8, Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. That's an interesting statement. Is it coming from the God who is omniscient, the one who knows all things? He says, I don't know of any other gods. Well, if he's not aware of any other, there aren't any others. Think about the Mormons who believe that there are at least three gods, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit believe they are separate gods, but they also believe that there's really innumerable gods in, in innumerable universes that have all be, gone from manhood to godhood. You know, that's basically why the Mormons are called God makers. They believe that you can actually become God. But there is only one God, and he knows of no others because there are none others. Israel's great confession in Deuteronomy 6.4 is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. They understood there was but one Lord, there is but one God. But God also reveals in his word the simple truth that there are three persons who are called God. There's one God, but there are three persons. The Father in 1 Corinthians 8 verses 5 and 6, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, and certainly Paul here means false gods. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things and we exist for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we exist through him. Again we saw this morning the Son is called God in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And again Paul calls him in, in Romans 9.5, the eternally blessed God who is over all. And the Holy Spirit is called God. In Acts 5, verses 4 and 5, again, that probably the, the clearest passage that we have, besides the fact that the Spirit of God is clearly uh, distinguished as a person, that the Spirit of God clearly is creative, that he does the acts of God, that he commands as God would command and so forth, we have this clear statement. But Peter said to Ananias, remember when Ananias sold the piece of land, said he had given it all, but in fact hadn't. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to men, you have lied to God. So clearly the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all in Scripture called God, which is why we see their names in several passages paralleled in a way that shows their equality. For instance, the benediction that I read just a few moments ago talking about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, how could he tie those names together in this benediction if the three were not equal? I mean, could you put your name in the place of any one of these persons? Would you dare do such a thing? 
but yet the three are paralleled. And of course, the baptismal formula that Jesus gives when he gives his commission to the church, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now again, what names could you possibly substitute for those three names? They are the only three identified in Scripture as God, and the fact that they are used together in this way and paralleled shows their equality. Now again, if we had time, we could look at many other evidences, but I, I hope that's enough to prove this point. And again, so that you're not tempted as the apostolic church and the United Pentecostal Church, or I should say church, because we don't believe them to be true churches, that you wouldn't be tempted to resolve the mystery that there is one being that is called God, and yet there are three persons who are called God in Scripture by thinking that these are just three names for one person. And I, I point out these two particular churches because they believe there is one person, Jesus, and that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all Jesus, okay? God shows us in his word that they are distinguished from one another as separate persons. Here's a few examples. Jesus was with the Father in the beginning. We already saw that. Jesus is God, and yet he's, he's with God, John 1, 2. He was in the beginning with God. Now, the second, as it were, not really a second God, but the second reference to God is the Father, Jesus is with the Father, he is not the Father, as again those churches believe. We see that the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, unless he just kind of embraces himself and, and says, I, I love me. You know, these are two different persons, aren't they? John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. John 15.9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. And then John 14, 31. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Well, obviously, they can't be the same person and express themselves in, in such a way. Uh, this mutual love, even this command that the Father gives to the Son and the Son submits to it. Uh, we read in Scripture that the Father and the Son both send the Spirit. That, again, we, we see a distinction between these three. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus says, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You see the, the interaction of persons. They can't be the same person. In John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus goes and he sends the Spirit. And then, of course, that classic passage that shows us all three persons again together, at, as it were, at one time at Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So basically, here's a summary of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, there are, of course, different things that distinguish the persons. You know, we're aware of that. We have, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they reveal themselves with these names for a reason. The Father is the Father of the Son. He begets the Son. The Son is begotten of the Father from all eternity. And as we understand it, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, we're not going to get into that particular thing, but let's just say, or let's just recognize that there are three names, and those names have some significance. But they do refer to three separate persons, all of whom are called God. So there is one God, the Scripture says, one infinite, eternal, and unchangeable being who is spirit, he's spiritual in nature. But there are three persons called God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three persons are not the same person. 
This is the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I wanted to go over that fairly quickly because I do want to tell you, well, what difference does it make what you believe regarding God? Why is it important that you believe in the Trinity? Well, it's important for the same reason that John said that it's important that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ because if you don't believe it, you're not going to be saved. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you won't be saved. If you don't believe in the Trinity, you can't be saved. Now, why would we say that? Because we, you know, we may, maybe we know people who have been converted who didn't understand the Trinity. And I'm not saying you can't be converted without understanding the Trinity. There are people who are converted who don't, and many of us still struggle to try to understand that doctrine. What I'm saying is, though, if a person is genuinely converted by the true God, then when they are exposed to the doctrine of the Trinity like you just have, they will accept it because this is what God's Word says. But we do need to understand they do have to accept it. They cannot reject it. And why is that? Because this is who God is. This is how He has revealed Himself. This is how the true God is distinguished from all the other so-called gods in the world. The fact that he is triune. Now let's back up and, and kind of get a running start at this to make sure we understand it. Jesus did say on one occasion in John 17 verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know the true God. Now in this context, that is the Father, because that is the one that Jesus is praying to. To have eternal life is to know Him. And to have eternal life is to know Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, in your nature. Now, how can you know the true God? How can you know the true Jesus? How can you come into this relationship? Now, I'm using know in two different meanings or two different senses here. How can you come into a knowing relationship with the Father or with the Son if you don't know who they are? Okay, if, if you don't identify them or distinguish them from every other God or uh, Savior, as it were, in the world. How can you come into a saving relationship with God unless you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, the simple fact is you can't come in any other way except through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And yet, how can you believe in him if you don't know who he is. Remember, John is telling us who he is so that you might believe, so that you might be saved. He didn't just come up and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in this context. But he says, I've written these things to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. You are not saved by a name, you see. You are saved by the person that is designated by that name. I've used this illustration in the past. I'm going to expand it a bit. But Jesus, the taxi driver, cannot save you from your sins. Neither can Jesus, the mason, or Jesus, the tax preparer, or Jesus, the business executive, or Jesus, the government official. You see, they may bear the name Jesus, but that name can't save you, and those people can't save you. There is only one Jesus who can save you. That has to be Jesus of Nazareth. That has to be the son of Abraham. That has to be the son of David. He has to be, as John tells us, the son of God because that is the only Jesus who can save you. But which God is Jesus the son of? Well, he's the son of the true God. He's the son of the triune God. The God or the son of the God of Islam, I'm not sure if they actually believe he has a son, cannot save you. Neither can the son of the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses, nor can the son of the, the God of the Mormons, nor that of the Apostolic and United Pentecostals, nor that of the Mormons. You see, only the son of the triune God 
who reveals himself in the Bible can actually save you. You can't have the right Son of God unless you have the right God. And that God is triune. This is how he distinguishes himself. Now, I want you to realize this isn't just a kind of a late innovation, something we thought of along the way that suddenly you have to believe in the Trinity. This is something that was believed very early on as they learn more about, you know, the nature of God. You'll remember who Athanasius is. Athanasius was the, uh, he was a deacon who defended the doctrine of the Trinity at the time of Arius and we do believe that Jehovah's Witnesses believe the same thing Arius believed, that Jesus was a creature, that he wasn't God, that he wasn't of the same substance as the Father, but he was of a similar substance. He was like God, but he was not God himself. Well, Athanasius said, no, he is very God of very God. He is the Son of God. He is God who is with God. Uh, the Word was God. There was a very early uh, a confession that was formulated very early on in the church that bore Athanasius' name, and it reminds us of what it is the church, even in that early date, was confessing. Remember the Council of Nicaea was 325. This is very early on. But this is what we read, and I don't know if we have this uh, displayed or not, but Articles 1 through 4 of the Athanasian Creed, whoever will be saved... Before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, and by that, it doesn't mean, of course, Roman Catholicism. That was still many centuries in the making, in the future. But the universal faith, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. We worship, he says, one God in Trinity. In other words, he's triune, he's three persons. And yet they are Trinity in unity, they are one God. Neither confounding the persons, they're not the same person, they're distinguished. And on the other hand, we don't divide God up into three gods as though you know, the Father possesses one third of, of the of this being of God and the Son possesses one-third and the Spirit possesses one-third, then you've divided God up and you've made three gods. No, there's just, there's just one God with three centers of consciousness, with three personalities within that being who are separate persons. Even as early as, as this creed, we see they believe that you must believe that if you are to believe in the true God and have the true Jesus Christ in order that you actually might be saved. So why is it important you believe in the Trinity? <laughs> well, it's because that's the only way you can know you have the true God and the true Jesus Christ and be saved. Now that's one reason. But there is another reason. I'm, I'm sure there are others, but there's only two that I, I'm bringing this evening. The other is because you need to realize that you owe your salvation to each member of the Godhead. When we talk about the Trinity, we, we talk about the Trinity in a couple of different senses. You know, who, who they are or who God is and, and what he is like in and of himself. But we need to realize these three persons actually covenanted. Sometimes we call this the covenant of redemption. They plotted, as it were. They planned together this everlasting plan that was in their, their minds, as it were, throughout all eternity that they would save us and that each person would have their part to play in our salvation. And because of that, each one, of course, is to be glorified. The Father chose you. The Son paid the price for you. And the Spirit of God is what the Son purchased so that he might dwell in you and make you like Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't see that, if you don't understand that, you won't give the glory that you actually owe to each of the persons. Sometimes we, we focus just on one of the persons and we seem to forget they're all involved. You know, we get this idea that God the Father is standing with his lightning, as it were, ready to destroy us, and yet the Son, as it were, intervenes. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? And sometimes we focus so much on Jesus Christ, we forget the Spirit of God is also God and he is to be worshipped. We can't neglect any of the persons of the Godhead. They are all involved. Now, as I've said, first, the Father chose you. 
It's the reason why you were a Christian here this evening. The only reason is because the Father chose you. We read Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Notice, not because we would be holy, but that we might be holy. He chose us to holiness. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. I want you to notice here that Paul says, the Father is the one who singled you out, the one who chose you to eternal life. And I want you to notice that He, he did not make this choice based upon anything He saw in you, nothing good in you, but purely according to the kind intention of His will. That's the only reason that is given here besides to the praise of the glory of His grace. He wanted to glorify His grace. And so He showed this unmerited favor to you by choosing you out even though you were His enemies, even though you hated Him, even though if you could, even though we don't think of it in these terms, this is the kind of evil that's in our hearts, you would have killed Him if you could. That's how the Lord represents us coming into the world. And But by God's restraining grace, this is what we would all be like but even though this was our condition, the Father still decided to show mercy according to the kind intention of His will. He chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, before any of us were born and had done anything good or bad like it was with Jacob and Esau. The Lord said, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. It was purely God's good intention, His good will to glorify His grace that He made this choice. So you owe your salvation to God the Father. But secondly, Jesus, who is God, agreed to pay the price for your redemption. 1 Peter 1, verses 17 through 19. Peter writes, If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You see, the Father chose you, but Jesus agreed to come into this world to live for you and to die for you, to lay down His life to save you, to pay the price that you owed to God's justice. So you owe your salvation to God the Son. But one thing that we often don't realize is this. The Spirit is what Jesus came into the world to purchase for you in order that you might be saved. The Father gives the price. The Son is the price. And the Spirit of God is what is purchased by the price. You've got to remember that... Um, this is the restoration of what was lost in the fall. We read in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, In Him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of the inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Again, the reason behind it is to glorify God, to praise Him, but notice that the Spirit of God was given to you as a pledge, as a down payment, with a view to the full redemption that God has. He's going to, he's going to take you to Himself, fully redeem you, plus you are going to inherit not just this down payment, you're going to get the whole kingdom. But I do want you to notice that the Spirit of God is what Jesus purchased for you. He is what the price pays for, as it were. Now, the Spirit, as we know, He's the one who takes what Jesus Christ did and He applies it to you. He applies it to you by uniting you to Christ. As we saw, He baptizes you into one body. And at that time, He takes up residence in your soul and begins to work inside of you to transform you from the inside out into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, 
This is what Adam lost in the fall when he sinned against God and he suddenly realized he was naked. Well, was he so dumb as to not realize he wasn't wearing clothes? Well, this, this isn't what is really meant by the fact that he realized that he was naked. It wasn't so much that he realized there wasn't wearing any clothes, but he had lost his original righteousness. He lost the Spirit of God and he felt naked and guilty before God and so he tried to cover it up with fig leaves, but that wasn't good enough. He needed the Spirit of God back. But Jesus is the only one who could bring the Spirit of God back, and that is what he did through his work. So what Adam lost, which was, again, this original righteousness, what we call original righteousness, the Holy Spirit who gives you the desire to love God and do what's pleasing to him, the Son regained through his work. The Spirit's living in your soul and acting in your soul as an active principle, um, fulfilling the law of God within you by giving you a love for what is good and what is right. Again, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, the Spirit of God lives in you. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And again, the idea that uh, the Spirit of God now dwelling in you, that He's working Christ's image in you, he's, who is, again, the one who reveals God to us, He is what, what Peter calls the, um, uh, the divine nature that dwells in us, that we have become partakers of the divine nature. That's what he writes in Second Peter verses one, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And by this, again, we don't understand, and certainly the, Paul or Peter doesn't mean that we become gods, as some of these you know, health and wealth charismatics seem to be teaching today, which is blasphemy. But rather, we share in his moral nature. The Spirit of God works the image of Christ within us. He's the one who gives us the power to trust in Jesus Christ, he is the one who transforms us into the image of Christ. He is what Jesus purchased. He is basically uh, integral to salvation. So you owe your salvation to the Father for choosing you. You owe your salvation to Jesus Christ for, for paying the price. You know, the Father gives the price, the Son pays the price, and you owe your salvation to the Spirit of God because He is what Jesus purchased. And He is, as we've already seen, a divine person himself. So the, the doctrine of the Trinity not only shows you, of course, which God sent his son to save you, we do need to believe in the triune God if we're going to have the right Jesus, but it also shows you how you are indebted to God, to each person of the Godhead, to God alone, not to God and a creature, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses seem to believe, you know, there's one God and Jesus is a creation. Not to uh, God, a creature, and an impersonal force, again, which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, not to three gods, which is what the Mormons believe. And not to just one person who expresses himself in, in three different modes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as the Apostolic and United Pentecostal Church believes. You owe your salvation to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, Father chose you and sent, paid the price. Jesus came and he offered that price. The Holy Spirit is what he purchased. That's why it's important that you believe the doctrine of the Trinity. That's the, the you know, at least one of the applications that it, and one of the differences it should make in your life. So let me ask you this evening, is that what you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is the son of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If you do believe that, and if you're looking to him alone to save you, 
if you are turning from all your sins, which is the evidence that you really are trusting in him, and you are trying your best to live according to all of his ways from your hearts, then you are saved. You are saved purely by the grace of God the Father alone, the grace of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. You are saved by, again, the triune God and the grace of God alone. So let me just remind you this evening that you make sure that you give them credit and glory for every single part of that salvation, that you give it to God alone because it is His work from beginning to end alone. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's pray that God would help us to do just that, to give all three persons the glory that is theirs.